Hello, my name is Todd Bennett and I'm currently in Jerusalem, Israel celebrating Sukkot. According to the Torah calendar, using the two great lights prescribed in Genesis 1, 14 through 16. That text reads as follows. Then Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and moedim and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. The passage in Genesis describes that the lights were placed in the firmament of the heavens to divide and determine how and when to keep the Moedim the appointed times. So, if you want to properly keep the appointed times, you'd better be using the two great lights described in the text. Strangely, during this time of restoration, many people in the Hebrew Roots movement who claim to follow the Torah decide not to follow the Torah when it comes to the calendar. Instead, they decide to follow what is known as the Jewish calendar. Now, the Jewish calendar is a fixed calculation attributed to Hillel II around 359 CE, and it does not use the lights described in Genesis 1, 14 through 16. As a result, it does not comport with the Torah. This is where it's important to determine what camp you're in. The calendar is one of those issues that reveals the difference between Jewish roots and Hebrew roots, between Messianic Judaism and the way taught by Yeshua. You see, Hebrew roots is supposed to identify and ascribe to the covenant made with Abraham that passed through the seed of Isaac and Jacob, who was later named Israel. Jewish roots, on the other hand, can mean that you identify with the tribe of Judah or the religion of Judaism, including the customs and traditions of the Jewish religion. Now, of course, the religion of Judaism derived from the Pharisees who survived the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. So Jewish roots can mean following the Pharisees. Now, while the Messiah Yeshua was from the tribe of Judah, he was not a Pharisee and was not involved with the religion of Judaism because it hadn't been invented yet. Uh, he was an Israelite in the covenant, and indeed, he was the covenant. Speaking of the Messiah, in Isaiah 42, 6, we read, I, Yahuwah, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Now, Yeshua came as a covenant to the people and as a light. And as a result, we're supposed to walk in his light and be light. Uh, looking at the lights to keep his appointed times as Moedim is part of that covenant and a reminder that we should be walking in the light. Just as those lights were set in place to divide the day from the night, the light from the dark, so we're supposed to also distinguish and divide uh, the light from the dark, and that's part of what it means to be set apart. Now in Luke 12, Yeshua starts out by warning his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees. He later goes on to state in verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Uh, do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower's coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, how can you discern the face of the sky of the earth, but how is it that you cannot discern this time? So, while most people in that time expected the Messiah to come and restore the divided kingdom of Israel, Yeshua specifically stated he came to divide, and he rebuked them for their failure to discern the time. Now, this wasn't the only time that he came down hard on the Pharisees. Uh, anyone who reads the clear words of Messiah knows that Yeshua severely rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. While they purported to be the religious leaders, Yeshua stated that they were not of Elohim. 
in John 8, 42 through 47, we read, Yeshua said to them, If Elohim were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from Elohim. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of Elohim hears Elohim's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of Elohim. He said their father was the devil. He also stated that they were not in the kingdom in Matthew 5.20. He said they were blind and called them blind guides repeatedly throughout Matthew 23. He told them, You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Matthew 23.13 He said they were full of uncleanness, hypocrisy, and lawlessness in Matthew 23.27-28 which means that they were not following the Torah. He called them serpents and a brood of vipers and asked how they could escape the condemnation of hell, Matthew 23, 33. And we know that for a time the followers of Yeshua continued to go to the synagogues where the Torah was read every Shabbat, and we read about that in Acts 15. But ultimately, after the destruction of the temple and the development of the Jewish religion, there was a separation between those who followed Yeshua and those who did not. Uh, in the absence of a temple, the synagogues became the focus of Jewish uh, religious observance and the source of Pharisaic rabbinic authority. Now, ultimately, the synagogue liturgy uh, included what is known as the Birkat HaMenim, the curse of the Menim, which likely was directed against the Notzrim, uh, the followers of Yeshua. So, the followers of Yeshua ultimately left the synagogues. They didn't stay for the sake of unity. In fact, Yeshua later referred to them as the synagogues of Satan in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. And that separation continued to grow until we saw two entirely separate religions develop, Judaism and Christianity. Now, Judaism traces straight back to the Pharisees and Christianity traces straight back to the Roman Empire. The true followers of Yeshua were excluded from both of these man-made religious systems. And neither religious system follows the Torah, and neither religious system represents or follows the true Messiah. We now see a large number of people seeking truth and coming out of Christian paganism, and their eyes have been opened, and they can no longer remain in the Christian religion, and many find themselves in the wilderness, like lost sheep. They're yearning for fellowship, as they once had in the church, because they feel alone. And here's the thing. Sometimes walking in the light means walking alone. Uh, but while you may feel alone, you're really not alone. There was a time when the prophet Elijah was being hunted by Ahab and Jezebel, and he thought he was alone. Uh, he thought he was the only one left in the north serving Yah. Uh, it was only when he went into the wilderness and up the mountain of Elohim that he learned, and we read in 1 Kings 19, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So sometimes we need to go into the wilderness and ascend the mountain alone like Elijah in order to hear the still small voice that we read about in 1 Kings 9.12. Yeshua came to divide and he did indeed divide. Uh, he will later come to unite and one account of that unification is found in Ezekiel 37 beginning at 19. It says, Thus says Yahuwah Elohim, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus says Yahuwah Elohim, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. 
They shall not defile themselves anymore with idols, nor their detestable, detestable things, nor with uh, any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their Elohim. Notice that Yahuwah Elohim will be uniting and it will be through a regathering. Yeshua specifically proclaimed in John 10, 14-15, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Yeshua was talking to the Yahudim at that time, those from the house of Yehuda, and his other sheep were from the house of Yisrael. So Yeshua, the good shepherd, will be the one gathering the sheep and uniting them into one flock. It's not our job to unite. Indeed, it's presumptuous to think that we should be the ones uniting, especially when it means compromising and disobeying the Torah. And I actually see people who claim to follow Yeshua willing not to mention him for the sake of unity, so as not to offend their Jewish brethren. Uh, they're making unity their overriding concern because they want to be accepted and belong. Yeshua specifically warned his disciples in John 16, 2-3, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers Elohim service, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time come, comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So he never instructed us to seek unity with the Pharisees who rejected him. Our job is to follow him and obey him. And he specifically commanded us to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations in Matthew 28, 19. Uh, so if you're in the covenant renewed by the blood of Yeshua, Messiah, then you are in the assembly of Israel. And the Torah describes Israel as a kingdom of priests and a holy or set-apart nation in Exodus 19.6. Indeed, Peter reiterated this identity of those who trust in Yeshua in 1 Peter 2.9. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we're called out of darkness, and we're not supposed to be walking in the darkness that the Pharisees walk in. And that applies to the rules, regulations, and traditions of the Pharisees, including their calendar. You see, rabbinic Judaism follows a fixed calendar. It's based upon a calculation that has nothing to do with the light. We're supposed to be looking to the lights and walking in the light. And if you're following the Pharisees, you are walking in darkness. You'll typically not be meeting with Yahuwah at his appointed times, and therefore you will not be properly obeying the commandments. Now I'm recording this video on September 14th, 2019 on the Gregorian calendar. It's day 14 of month 7 on the Torah calendar, which means that tomorrow is day 15 of month 7. It's a high Sabbath and marks the beginning of Sukkot. The calculated rabbinic calendar will be celebrating Sukkot one month late on October 13th. So, if you follow the Pharisees, then you're not following the Torah, and you'll miss this important appointed time. Right now, the house of Israel is being sifted. In Amos 9.9 we read, For surely I command and will sift the house of Israel among the nations. As grain is sifted in a sieve, uh, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. As we rehearse the appointed times, we're being tested. Will we diligently obey? Or will we just give up and follow the, the, the multitudes? Uh, one of these tests are whether we will follow the Creator and walk in His light, or instead follow the Pharisees and walk in darkness for the sake of unity. The choice should be obvious if you're one of the chosen of Elohim. Hag Samach from Jerusalem.